Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Angie Goodnight. I'm going to start us off this evening, but we're going to give it a couple of minutes to uh, allow everybody to get into the room before we really get going. Have we given it enough time, we think? Everybody in? You can hear me okay? Yeah. I think your, vid your, your audio is supposed to be off right now, though. Sorry, Ken. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. I'd like to personally thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, we have a, a lot to be said this evening. Um, as I said, my name is Angie Goodnight. I work in the Advocacy and Information Referral Department at the Ability Center. I'm also a member of CATER, and CATER is, is the group that has organized this forum tonight. CATER stands for Consumer Advocates for Transportation Rights. Um, the group has been around, we discussed almost about 12 years. Um, we're always looking for new members. Um, you know, just advocates for transportation. Personally, this is really dear, near and dear to my heart. I am a person with a disability. I take public transportation. And uh, so putting this together has been a lot of fun. And I think we're all gonna learn something. Um, we are gonna listen to <clears throat> local and state um, stakeholders about our budget, our transportation budget, and why it is so important to our area. Um, after this, after we, we have this this evening, everybody's gonna receive an email. We have a call for action um, that we'd really like everybody to come on board, make phone calls, send letters. You know, we all have a voice and I think everybody needs to hear our voice. And, and this is your chance to speak up and let everybody, you know, let, let our, our senators know why this is so important to us. Um, we are gonna use the Q&A for any questions. And at the end, we will try to get to everybody's uh, questions. If we're unable to, if, as long as you use the Q&A, it will provide us with your email. So if we're not able to answer your question at the end, uh, we will absolutely get back to you um, with an answer for your question. So without, without further ado, I'm gonna uh, introduce Katie. Katie Shelley. Um, is an advocate at the Ability Center as well. And uh, she's got a pretty big part tonight introducing everybody and keeping time. So, Katie. Yeah, thank you, Angie. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Shelley, and I am a disability rights advocate, like Angie said, and I'm also a TARPS writer. And I will be introducing all of our speakers to you this evening. So, Kim Dunham, who is the executive director of TARDA, is not able to be here tonight as originally planned because she is currently in Columbus advocating on TARDA's behalf and she is providing testimony to the transportation budget in the Ohio Senate. So tonight representing the Toledo Area Regional Transit Authority is Kelsey Hoagland, the president of the Board of Trustees for TARDA. Kelsey's career has been focused on connecting communities through the movement of people. Kelsey works in public relations at the Ohio Department of Transportation and previously worked for the Central Ohio Transit Authority, or CODA, for several years. Kelsey is committed to strengthening our transit system into a frequent and reliable service that is accessible to everyone in our region. Tonight, she is going to be discussing the importance of robust state transportation funding and advocating for that funding in the Ohio Biennium budget and what that funding means for us locally. Please help me welcome Kelsey. Thank you, Katie. I'm so glad to be here tonight with you all. Um, like Katie said, Kim is not able to join us tonight because today she was uh, given the opportunity to testify in front of the Transportation Committee on the Senate floor. Um, she did very well. They were able to live stream it, so I was able to listen in. Um, and she did have a very strong delivery to the Transportation Committee. 
So with that being said, I'm going to discuss a couple of things that um, are important about House Bill 74. Uh, that is what she was testifying on behalf today. So House Bill 74, originally, as it was written, it included some very important language that pertains to TARDA. Unfortunately, that language did get pulled recently. Um, so that's what Kim was advocating for today is to get that language reinstated in the final bill. So I'm going to tell, tell you a little bit about the current landscape of TARDA, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with since you guys are writers. Um, but currently, TARDA is comprised of seven member communities. In addition to the city of Toledo, those are Maumee, Ottawa Hills, Sylvania, Sylvania Township, Waterville, which is where I'm from, and Rossford, which is in Wood County, but that's how some regional transits work well, is that they bleed over into neighboring counties. Um, so currently, as it stands, all seven member communities must all unanimously approve any changes that we want to make, whether it be granting new members, such as Lucas County, or if we want to seek new funding mechanisms. All seven member communities must unanimously agree to approve whatever it is that we are trying to achieve. Um, so both of those things are very important. Lucas County, um, granting them membership into a member community would allow us to expand our service area. There are many locations within Lucas County that are uh, high employment centers and high areas for economic development, but that are not currently accessible on public transit using TARDA. Um, so having Lucas County be a member community would allow us to expand that service area. In addition to that, pursuing a sales tax. We would need, again, that unanimous consent from all of our member communities in order to seek a ballot opportunity to have voter approval for a sales tax. So right now we are funded currently by two property taxes. Um, and what this language would ultimately do would be repeal those two property taxes and replace it with one half percent sales tax. So today, speaking to House Bill 74 on the Senate floor, Kim was trying to change that language so that TARDA will become, or so that the language states that you need majority consent instead of how it's currently written, which is unanimous. And I say that over and over because like Angie said, we all have the ability and the opportunity right now. This is a call for action. We have the opportunity to reach out to our legislators and tell them the importance of approving this measure. Okay, so again, House Bill 74 today, what Kim is really seeking to do is all the language is saying, it's not to start a new tax right now or anything like that. It is just making it so that we have majority consent rather than unanimous, which is all seven member communities must approve whatever it is that we're trying to do. So again, just to reiterate, this is a very critical step in admitting Lucas County so that again, we can expand our service area. And this doesn't mean that we're gonna have a bus line that goes to every single location within the county. It just means that we have the ability to expand to again, reach those employment centers that are not currently being served and pursue those different service opportunities. This, um, so just to give you a little bit of background about this effort, um, in the past, like I said, we have to have that unanimous consent. So four times since 2010, we have gone to our member communities to try to have them, sorry if you guys can hear my dogs barking out there, um, but we have gone to them several times, four times in the past 10 years, trying to get this changed over so that they would allow us to go onto the ballot to pursue a sales tax. Unfortunately, we've fallen short each time. One of, at least one of the member communities has had some sort of reason or justification that uh, they don't want us to move forward. In 2020, this past year, it was the first time ever that we got six out of the seven member communities to give us the thumbs up. Unfortunately, it was the last member community who said no, so we were not able to move forward with that measure last year. This year, if we change that language, if the Senate bill is able to change the language to state that it is a majority consent rather than unanimous, it will give us that opportunity to pursue this again, but just with majority approval of our member communities. So, um, you know, it, it will be an easier path forward and truly it is how other um, agencies work statewide. So I'm gonna briefly, and our goal for this is to go onto the ballot in November of 2021. Our timeline is really tight. I mean, this legislation is happening right now and when it does get approved is really gonna make a big difference for us on whether or not we're able to pursue it um, in, in the timely fashion that we're hoping to. So uh, stick with me. I'm gonna just try to share my screen for a moment. 
I'm so sorry about the dogs. I, there's nothing I can do about them. All righty, so hopefully you guys can see my screen now. And what I want to show you is this map. So what this map shows us is how the different agencies, the larger in the larger metropolitan areas of Ohio, are funded. Cleveland currently has a 1% sales tax. Akron, a half a percent sales tax, which is what TARDA is pursuing. Columbus, a half a percent sales tax. Dayton, a half a percent sales tax. And Cincinnati just recently passed similar legislation um, that puts them at point eight percent sales tax uh, but they have theirs is very specific as you see over here it's very specific to their transit area and what the, the their taxing district so theirs is a little bit different than the rest of the agencies that you see here on the, in the screen um, but again toledo is the last major metropolitan area who is not funded by a sales tax we're the last ones that remain on the property tax uh, so definitely very important for us to modernize our system to have that funding. As riders, you guys are, I'm sure, very familiar with the fact that our technology um, has not kept up with the times, including we don't have automatic passenger counters, which is really how service planners design routes to better serve the community. So without that information, we're really not able to build the most effective routes. All right, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. All right, so I just wanna go over our key takeaways again. What I'm trying to reiterate is that this is not, we are not pursuing legislation that approves a new sales tax. This is simply just to change that language from a unanimous consent of our member communities to a majority consent of our member communities to pursue whatever it is, whether it be admitting new members or pursuing new funding mechanisms. It's just modifying the statutory requirement. Uh, we have tremendous support in this. We have great support from our transit peers within Ohio, so from the Ohio Public Transportation Association, and along with our member, our, our, I'm sorry, our transit peers. And then also our key stakeholders are really engaged in this effort. As citizens of Toledo, I'm sure you all are aware that we have really great momentum right now with the city of Toledo and being a partner of theirs, with the Toledo Area Chamber of Commerce, um, who is a tremendous supporter of this initiative and who also submitted written testimony today to the Senate as well. Um, so we have a really great momentum in that way and that we have a lot of partners who previously weren't necessarily at the table. So this is this is very important time for us. Um, just as a little bit of an update, I think that I might have mentioned in the beginning, this language was originally written into House Bill 74, but the TARDA language was removed before it was approved. Uh, so today, Kim went and provided that testimony to the Senate floor, uh, to the Transportation Committee, and we are expecting to have the support of Senate in moving forward. Um, we're really hoping that we have those champions who reinstate this language and um, go through the reconciliation process. So the transportation budget at this point is to be adopted by April 1st. Like I said, our timeline is very narrow right now and in making all the stars align. Um, but it is a very exciting time for TARDA and I tremendously hope that you all will join me and reach out to your legislators to tell them about this important effort. Um, and like I said, we do have just so many wonderful partners and I'm gonna share my screen again really quickly just so you guys can get an idea of all the people who are championing this for us and, and are, on our, are on our side. So you can see a number of community partners and businesses in the area, um, again, with a number of different destinations that are so vital to our community. Um, and then these are just a brief list of the local officials whose support we have at this time. Um, again, there is never, you can't say it too much. Uh, just to reiterate one more time, what we're seeking with this legislation is that we would be changing from the unanimous consent of all seven, seven of our member communities into a majority consent of those members um, so that we can change our legislation, admit new members and pursue new funding mechanisms. So uh, with that being said, I think that Katie, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, and of course, look forward to any questions that might come through the chat later in the in the opportunity. But thank you all so much for letting me speak today. All right, so it looks as though Representative Skindle had to leave for a House committee vote. So we are going to go on to the next speaker. Um, we have Stu Nicholson 
who is the executive director of All Aboard Ohio. And All Aboard Ohio is the only statewide advocacy organization for more and better passenger rail and local public transit development and service. Stu is also instrumental in the Move Ohio Coalition, which is a diverse statewide coalition of advocates who represent the interests of everyday transportation users and whose vision is a better funded multimodal transportation network in Ohio that prioritizes a complete network of affordable and accessible transportation options, including public transit, passenger and freight rail, and walkable, bikeable streets. Stu? Thank you. Okay, and, uh, and, and thank you everybody for taking part in this, uh, in this uh, event this afternoon. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to see that Representative Skindell had, Skindell had to uh, leave momentarily, but hopefully he'll be back fairly soon. Um, I, 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 sh I would be remiss in not saying that he has been one of our major allies in the House as far as, as uh, obtaining the transit funding that has been approved by the House of Representatives and now goes into the Senate. So, so uh, you know, offer, offer him offer him a silent cheer when uh, when he comes back on. Uh, I, really, right now, what we have the current situation we have right now is that a bill has been advanced from the House. Um, without going into a, a minute detail, um, the the House decided to completely throw out the suggested cuts to transit funding uh, from Governor DeWine, and those cuts would have been unbelievably severe. Um, he was, uh, in 2019, he came, he actually came through with a request for an increase in transit funding, but it was so minuscule, it was almost laughable. So, um, you know, so uh, we, we found allies in the House and the Senate. We wound up uh, uh, having $70 million per year uh, in, in the biennial budget. So that's $70 million each, each of two years for $140 million. This time around, we are now looking at $193 million from a variety of sources, um, general revenue funds, federal flex funds that come into, uh, into the uh, Ohio Department of Transportation budget. Um, those, are, those are included. There is a small clawback um, amendment that was put in by one of the House members that if, uh, if more federal funding becomes available um, to ODOT uh, that is directed at transit, that, that will be taken, that will, some of the, the corresponding amount will be taken out of whatever the, whatever was approved by the House. Um, the Senate will probably make some changes if they run true to form, uh, which, uh, which they did back in uh, 2019. Um, they will probably come up with their own ideas, their own amounts, where the money is coming from, uh, and then the, whatever bill that the Senate comes up with will have to be reconciled with the House if it is in any way different from what the House has approved. And in, in all likelihood, that's what's, going, that's what's going to happen. So all the more reason why we need to really hammer on our, our state senators uh, between now and whenever, the, whenever a package comes up for a full vote. And, and it's not gonna be over yet. It, you know, even, even at that, like I say, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to uh, lobby our senators and members of the house because they will probably have to reconcile a bill and come up with a final number. So we need to, you know, the important thing for us as advocates is that we need to be able to, to impress upon all of our state representatives that we aren't just asking for dollars to connect people to jobs, education, and welfare. Those are, not, or healthcare, I should say. Those are all very important. But we also, but because this is the GOP controlled legislature in both houses, um, you'll pardon me, but we all we all have to kind of learn how to speak Republican, I guess. So what we have what we have to be doing is going to our senators and House members, and also saying transit is every bit as important to business, especially if they're expanding or if they're looking at locating in Ohio. Uh, you know, they the one thing that every business is, every business needs is an expanded workforce. The, the largest available workforce possible. 
Um, and, and, and to do that, you have to be able to make sure that transit is accessible to everybody, um, regard, regardless of your, of your station, regardless of your situation, that transportation has to be all encompassing in order to make it work. Um, that seemed to make an impression when I mentioned that to the House Finance Committee. Um, I think they, they, they understood what we were saying, but, you know, but we have to make sure that they understand that this, this is not and should not be a partisan issue. This is an issue that, that directly affects our economy, that directs, directly affects jobs, uh, health care, education, um, whoever needs access to the system, you know, that, that has an impact. And like I say, it has that impact on business and economic development, job creation. Um, we have a great example, and this is an example I brought up to the, to the uh, House Finance Committee. We have two areas near Columbus that are booming as far as warehouses and, and uh, you know, distribution centers. One of them is in London, Ohio, which is about 30 minutes west of 30 to 40 minutes west of, of where I live. The other one is down at Rickenbacker Air Base, which is south of Columbus, um, a little bit less of a distance, but still, still a pretty good haul. Uh, especially if you don't have access to a car or cannot drive, um, this you know it's it's a distance. The difference between these two is that Rickenbacker is is served very well by Coda, running between their their Columbus based routes and the Rickenbacker Air Base. Once those buses reach Rickenbacker, there is uh, actually, and this was formed of a little over a year ago, I believe. The, there, is a, there is a shuttle service bus that runs between all of the warehouses. And it is timed so that it, you know, it shows up at the Coda stop to pick up or drop off people that are coming in for a shift change because these are usually 24 hour operations. So we have that access there. We have that access for anybody that, that, that is willing and able to work at, at, the, uh, at these uh, distribution centers at Rickenbacker. By contrast, if you want to work at one of the warehouses in London, Ohio, you better have a car. And there lies the problem with the, with the development of transit in the state of Ohio. Um, you know, we're there, we are constantly fighting restrictions, uh, fighting uh, governmental barriers, um, you know, county lines, things like that. Uh, and, and this really shouldn't be. So I think as we come out of this budget, discussion i think probably our next job is going to be to try and and institute some trans some public transit reform in 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 the uh, in the state of ohio i think what um uh, i think what kelly kelsey uh, brought up up in toledo is a prime example of of the language in a law preventing progress from happening uh and 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 that's and that's wrong that's wrong because the people who get hurt are the very people that 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 you know we we are among among each other right now um you know and you know if you if you can't get access to the job you want or the education that you seek or the health care you seek um either you're prevented from it or you're or you're or you're there's an obstacle that makes it more difficult to access that is just patently unfair and that was, that's what has to change. Uh, the other thing that All Aboard Ohio is, is pushing for in the future is that we wanna see a dedicated source of funding within the ODOT budget, not outside in, in that's subject to general revenue funding, but within the ODOT budget that can be devoted towards public transportation, path, intercity passenger rail, and all of the things that connect us better. Um, you know, you know, it's, you know, ODOT is still primarily roads and highways and bridges and, uh, you know, and, and they're, though they have a transit division, it is still not what it should be. They, they try hard. I know people that work there, they try hard and, and they do their best, but it is still, um, you know, a minuscule effort compared to what the need is. So that's, that's basically our update. Um, the hearings start in the, in the Ohio Senate tomorrow. I know there is a news conference scheduled for tomorrow afternoon. I believe it's around two uh, o'clock. Um, uh, it's going to be a virtual news conference um, uh, by Zoom call like we're doing here. Um, and uh, that's being sponsored by Move Ohio. I will try to see if I can't get the link to that. 
so that if you want to listen in on the on the news conference, uh, you can. Uh, but the hearings will start tomorrow in the Ohio Senate. Um, we plan on delivering testimony, uh, we being all aboard Ohio. Um, but but I again, I cannot stress enough. If you know who your who your state senator is, make sure they hear from you. Make sure they hear from your friends and your neighbors uh, who appreciate what transit does, because that really has to come from the constituents. Um, we cannot have a state senator tell us, well, I'm not hearing this from my constituents. And, and trust me, I've heard that from some of them, whether they, you know, you know, hopefully they're, if they're telling the truth that they haven't heard, heard, heard from any of us, then shame on us for that. But, but we need to make sure that they cannot use that as an excuse. Anyways, I, I will finish up uh, when we get to questions. I'll be glad to answer some. And uh, thank you again, everybody, for uh, allowing me to be a part of this. Thank you, Stu. All right, so next we're gonna switch over to passenger testimonies from citizens local to the Toledo area who are going to speak about why public transportation is important to them and to others in the community. Our first testimonies are coming from Pastor Chris Hanley, who is a pastor at Glenwood Lutheran Church, and he will be sharing stories of parishioners and church employees who use public transportation to get to work and to worship, and also Ken Shoemaker, who is a parishioner at Glenwood Lutheran Church, and also a TARDA writer. Pastor Chris and Ken. Thank you, Katie. Uh, it's an honor to be part of this panel. Um, and as Katie said, uh, Ken and I are here as part of Glenwood Lutheran Church. We're right next door to the Toledo Museum of Art. And the number two bus runs right uh, in front of us down Monroe Street and stops uh, basically right between us and the museum. And we are here because people that we love and people that we serve, it, serve with rely on TARDA. That's, that's the main reason. Uh, our office administrator who basically, you know, who really runs the whole church relies on TARDA. Our custodian who keeps our building clean and who keeps our building sanitized uh, during the pandemic and does all sorts of things around the church relies on TARDA. We've got several community members um, who based on, you know, some physical or some mental health need rely on TARPS and TARDA. And we've got other folks who use the bus to visit us and get their basic needs met, whether it's household things or clothing um, or their spiritual needs met. So our people need a healthy transit system to be healthy and to get their needs met. So I wanna introduce uh, Ken, who is a leader on our board and my neighbor also in the Toledo's Old West End, uh, who has a unique perspective on the importance and the blessing of a good public transit system. Hey, hello. Uh, as Pastor Chris said, I'm Ken Shoemaker and I'm a member of Glenwood Lutheran Church. Uh, I also live in the neighborhood uh, and I've been a, a supporter of public transportation my whole life. I'm retired now. Uh, and uh, even before I became, I be, I've been a full-time TARDA consumer for over five years now. Uh, before that, I still used to use the bus a few times a year, mainly when the weather was really bad. Uh, but I, I have always been a user of fixed rail and other types of public transportation, not only elsewhere in, in the country, but also all over Europe. So I'm, I, I, I'm a firm believer that it's, it's a, a very, very valuable uh, uh, lifestyle to have. And, and what I see now that I'm full-time riding the bus in Toledo and I've really learned the system is that it really does raise the self-esteem of people that are riding it. Uh, that includes several of the people I know who go to Glenwood Lutheran Church. And uh, uh, it gives you a real sense of independence and not only to, to uh, get to and from the church, but it also facilitates people 
running all their errands and uh, special trips throughout the week. So um, I really, I'm, I'm a firm supporter of public transportation. And Ken, I know you've talked before that you've, uh, you've met interesting people on the bus. You've met people that you would never have met otherwise. Uh, that it has been really a creative uh, and life-giving yes. uh, presence for you. Yes, uh, I think for people that don't uh, take public transportation, I really encourage you to do it and, and learn how the system works because it, it's also a part of your, your daily social lifestyle too because you do learn, get to know people, uh, I, I get to know most of the bus drivers on a first name basis if uh, we see each other more than three weeks in a row. So um, it, it, it's definitely a, a, a positive thing for people's life. I actually heard a story today of a bus driver uh, suggesting a vocation for one of our folks. Like, you know, you could be a teacher and they've, they've thought seriously about that. Um, but the, the other thing that we want to talk to you, um, from, you know, on behalf of the folks of Glenwood Lutheran Church is that when TARDA is underfunded, that really disrupts the lives of our people. Um, I heard a story about, um, a great deal of worry about the, the timeliness of a TARPS ride to work, you know, folks who are worried that they were going to, um, that it was going to affect their employment if their TARPS ride didn't show up on time. Uh, folks that were worried they were going to miss an appointment to see their parent, who they only get to see during certain hours because of COVID. Uh, folks who've had to limit their participation in either whether it's work or whether it's things that are going on at the church, like try planning a Bible study when you've got to deal with uh, limited bus hours because TARDA just doesn't have adequate funding. And the big one, as you might imagine, is it really, it wounded our community when uh, TARDA had to, to not run buses on Sunday mornings. Uh, we could see the effects. Um, it, uh, one, of, one of the folks at our church said it, uh, it just hurt his feelings. And I can imagine there'll be folks who um, who would say, well, you're a church, you, you should just get other people to, uh, to give those people rides. Um, and that's not fair, as I imagine a lot of you know, uh, that it makes a big difference being able to arrive at church on your own terms, uh, not because somebody else was so generous, uh, you know, to, to do something for you, uh, but because then you're reliant on their, uh, on their timeliness. Um, you don't have that same feeling of independence. Um, and if you're able to take the bus to worship or to a Bible study or whatever it is that you're doing to practice uh, your tradition or get your spiritual needs met, uh, you can arrive with a sense of self and agency and feeling able. Um, and that's something that, um, that churches and other places of worship and communities of spiritual practice offer um, and, and a lens into this issue of public transportation for us. We gather a people with a sense of belonging across differences in power, in race, in ability, in gender and gender expression, uh, and to recognize in one another the image of God. And it's hard to dislike or categorize or make other a group of people when a person whose name you know is right there with you. Mm -hmm. And for, mm -hmm. for this reason, transportation rights are a religious issue for us. Um, as you've heard, uh, we've got lots of the needs of the people of our church that can be need to be met by their use of TARDA and TARPS. Uh, and that makes it an issue of loving our neighbors as ourselves for us. Um, but even, even more specifically, uh, our community is gathered around the figure of Jesus who reached across difference and power to encounter 
creatively and interact with new people. And we don't get to have such mutually engaging encounters without the chance to meet people who use TARDA to travel to us. And so that's why we, and I imagine lots of other churches and places of worship believe in a strong public transit system. And I know some churches would say uh, they're shy of political issues. And as you've heard, this is a political issue, but it's not a partisan issue. It's an issue uh, that goes back to the root of that word political. It's just yes. something that affects our city and the well-being of the people that live in or around our city. So there are many other places of worship, uh, the museum next door to us that's curating uh, opportunities for mutual encounters and affirming relationships. The museum I heard just announced uh, this part of community building in its strategic plan. And we need a well-funded TARDA in order to make those connections happen. So thank you. Thank you, Pastor Chris and Ken for the powerful testimony. We really appreciate you being here and really appreciate you sharing those stories with us. So thank you. Um, the next testimony that we have comes from Sarah Silver, who uses tarps to get to work. And she is going to explain why public transit, public transit is so important in her life. Sarah? Good evening. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today and share with you a little bit about my experiences as a tarps rider. Um, let's go back a little bit um, to my first job working at the Ability Center of Greater Toledo <laughs> a long time ago and um, people talking to me about, you know, my frustrations driving to work, finding rides and people saying, you know, you should really sign up for tarps. And I was like, mm, I'm kind of spoiled. I, I don't know. And I signed up for tarps and I... I've been a TARPS passenger for, gosh, 11 years. Uh, yeah, 11 years. And I actually have developed a very close bond to, um, to my feeling of independence when taking TARPS. So I utilize TARPS to go to work every day. I work full-time five days a week. And you know, really without TARPS, getting to work is very difficult. Um, there was a little bit of time during the pandemic where I um, had rides from family and I cannot lie. I told my family and they thought it was quite amusing, but I said, you know, like, I love you and I'm so appreciative that you're driving me, but I really, really miss my tarps rides, which I know sounds kind of silly, but to me, that was my time as it is. So for so many of you during your commute to drink my coffee, read my book and kind of get my brain ready for the challenges of the workday. And then also after the workday going home, get my brain into the mode of mom, 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 mom. So taking tarps for me has been such a sense of independence. And I actually, if I'm looking for a job, if people tell me there's another job that I should apply for, I won't do it unless it's in the tarps area because that feeling of freedom and independence that I get from being able to set up my own rides, to be able to go and come when I want to and not wait for somebody who'd be available to drive me is a very powerful and empowering feeling. So like I said, I use tarps to get to work every day. I also use tarps if I'm going fun places like shopping or wine tasting, or maybe I take it to take my guide dogs to the vet. I take it when I have to take my kids to the doctor. It's just a very, very important part of my life. And I'm so very thankful that we do have this service. I wish other people would realize the importance of having a system like TARDA or TARPS that um, people can utilize to be more independent, more into, yeah, more independent and to develop more freedom. Um, people talk a lot about like, oh, if you take like a paratransit service, you're always late for work. I, I am not always late for work. Um, my my drivers come on time. When I call and schedule, I am just treated very kindly and very respectfully. Um, I 
love that um, with a lot of the paratransit drivers who are longtime drivers, we really develop like fun relationships. So like the drivers that drive me know that I get on and I chat with them. I want to hear about their kids or their grandkids or, you know, what they're doing, if they're re remodeling their cabin up in Michigan or whatever. And then they know like a certain time in the ride, I'm going to say, I'm just going to read my book for a quick second. I pop my earbuds in and I read all the rest of the way to work. And it's funny to say but if you're in a car with somebody and they're driving you and it's not their job, they're just doing it to be nice, you're kind of beholden to that person. You have to talk to them. <laughs> you have to be appreciative. And again, it's not that I don't appreciate the TARPS drivers because I, I feel that they are a group of people that should be appreciated even more than what they are. But they know, like, they're okay with it. They're concentrating on their job, on their driving, and they know that if they pick me up that I'm going to be reading my book. Um, but TARPS has given me just a feeling of independence and freedom that I did not have prior to taking it. I don't know why it took me until I was an adult and working and that I, I wanted to utilize the service, but I'm so glad I did. And like I said, I will not ever take a job or, or you know, look around at places of employment that I can't get to using paratransit. Having that sense of independence and freedom gives me more confidence. I, I can get there on my own. I can leave when I want. I can set up my own rides and I can do it all and, being, and be treated like a person with dignity and respect. And that's something that you can't buy. It's something that, you know, if funders, if people working with legislation, if they didn't have their car for a week, they would really appreciate the ability to have a well-run public and paratransit system. So I really appreciate that you guys invited me here to share my experience. Thank you so much, Sarah. We really appreciate you being here and telling your story. So to close the forum, Cater member Jessica Weinberg will discuss action steps on how you can help make a difference in advocating for transportation funding. Also, Jessica's slides will be emailed to all participants in the follow-up email after this forum. Um, Jessica? Hi, everybody. Um, thanks everyone for being here tonight. Um, I appreciate the other uh, speakers that shared their stories. Um, Kate, I do wanna ask, are we, uh, is, we don't know if Rep Skindle's coming back or he might have to be after me. Um, if he comes back, we will have him speak after you. Okay. Um, my name is Jessica Weinberg. I am another TARPS rider. I have been, um, um, I should, I should share my screen. I, I am another, uh, I'm another uh, TARPS rider. As I said, I currently uh, take TARPS to well, um, prior to the pandemic, for about uh, four years, I had been taking uh, tarps to and from work five days a week, 40 hour job with benefits. Um, I do have disabilities that they're not always real visible. They're a little uh, complicated to get into, but as far as driving, um, it's issues of concentration, um, being able to watch everything at once, and reaction time, which you can appreciate are important um, when driving. And it's very hard to um, practice. I, I have kind of an interesting story because, because my disabilities weren't visible and they didn't necessarily lead to a lot of challenges in the classroom, I was, um, I was not labeled a person with a disability for much of my life. And so it was taken for granted that I could do things like go to college and hold a job. And even when things were challenging, it was kind of taken for granted that I could overcome it. And then we came to, well, almost literally a roadblock when it came to the question of driving and transportation. And I would say that a lot of, when, when I think about times when I didn't get a job or I wasn't able to interview for a job or I wasn't able to go after a career opportunity or some other kind of opportunity, it usually came back to transportation in some ways. And there are real subtle reasons that you don't think of how that can be a, a, a 
value in ways you don't think of, like when um, a group of friends decides to get together on the spur of the moment, or um, there's a last minute, um, somebody has a last minute family emergency uh, the week that they were going to uh, go to a fair and have a table for our organization. Uh, harder for me to jump in and cover for them because I don't have a, a car to take the boot, the, the materials that would be part of the booth. Um, and I also believe that in a more updated modern transit system, I might be able to use the fixed routes, more, fixed line tower more because um, a lot of my challenges are with navigating and changing buses and figuring out the, the routes um, about the only place you can kind of go directly from where I live is from is from downtown. Um, so every one of, of me is kind of a lost customer or a lost potential employee. Uh, if you're in an area that that we can't get to because it's not served by Toyota, um, a lot, a um, you um, have. Uh, um, you, you, it, it, it keeps people from um, having access to everywhere in Lucas County. Um, and it's, um, but for uh, people that don't necessarily um, have disabilities, um, the other political issue we're hearing a lot about right now is um, how much money to pay people, how much money to give them to get them through the pandemic if you can't work. Uh, there's a, a statistic from the American Public Transportation Association that a household could save more than $10,000 a year by reducing car reliance and using public transportation more. Um, so that is like, that would be like $10,000 a year back in the pockets of a lot of families. Um, as and uh, not everybody that has uh, some kind of physical or mental obstacle to driving um, is able to access a non-medical transportation like a waiver. Not everybody with a you know that on, that has a, a diagnosis in the medical or psychological sense automatically gets a waiver. Um, driving, I think, is kind of unique in terms of. Um, the ability to, um, it, 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 it can be a hard thing. There are people with diagnoses like mine who drive. The ones I've met have needed lots and lots of instruction, which isn't really available either. And many of them have had a lot of accidents. So there's a safety factor. It, it reduces uh, traffic deaths altogether if more people use public transportation. Um, Driving is kind of unique in that it's it's hard to practice and get better because the stakes can be so high if you make a mistake, the consequences of mistakes can be so high. And it can be difficult to practice for everything that can happen when you drive. So it's not always something that's a good idea or safe to, um, for people who, who might be borderline, who might have special challenges for them to, try to practice until they get it. Um, Angie did. Um, Angie and Katie did say, um, we, we are uh, sort of doing a, a call to action here. Um, what I've made up are some slides that give you some uh, kind of websites to check out. Just today, the Ability Center posted this, their call for action. It's on their, it went out by email and there's a, uh, it's on their Facebook page. Um, so that's a good place to check. Um, these are the two organizations represented tonight, Community Advocates for Transportation Rights, which we pronounce as CAIR. We have a Facebook page. Um, we've been doing a lot by email lately, so that's why I put up Angie's email as our contact. Send an email or like the page to keep up with the stuff we're doing. Might be a good idea to uh, send an email if you want like reminders of meetings in the future. Um, Move Ohio is statewide coalition uh, for a strong public transit system of which uh, all of Ward Ohio, of which uh, Stu represents that they're a member, the Ability Center, Cater are all supporting Move 
Um, they're kind of working on the, the statewide big picture um, website and Facebook page and uh, the contact. This, this contact is on the website. Uh, there's a letter there that's kind of lays out their platform that an organization, the other organizations can sign on to. We actually have a lot um, of organizations from Toledo have signed on. They're mostly connected with uh, the disability community, which which is great. But again, we want to um, we want to sort of get past the mentality that it's a, just a human service for those that absolutely can't drive. Um, so organizations can sign on to the letter. Uh, individuals can too, but obviously we want to build it up with um, organizational support. Um, I I want to share that that um, uh, slide that. Uh, a target board member shared, uh, talked about who's our, who's our partner and who's our ally and who's Toyota's ally. Um, in, the, in the years that I've been advocating on this issue, I realized that almost any time that somebody, whether locally or at the state level, didn't support us or said they were going to, said they were opposed to that Toyota language in the bill or they were opposed to the sales tax, even if it was a Toyota member community, themselves, they always kind of cited these Lucas County communities that are not Toyota members as, as their reason. Mark Clover doesn't want to have to be in Toyota, you know, one of those. Um, so these are some of the, these are the, and the reason I put them there is because I just feel like right where we are at right now, these local communities, both in and out of Toyota, have a lot of influence on what happens. So if you live in a member community, you want to let your members of city council and tr township trustees know that you use charter public transportation is important to you. You think we should be, we think you think we should stay as a member of charter and that you would like to see charter be accessible throughout Lucas County and funded by sales tax. Um, I didn't know if we might have anybody registered tonight that's from some of these parts of Lucas County that don't have charter. Um, I think it would be nice if people living there started bugging their council people and trustees um, that they'd like to have access to public transportation. As I said, they, they really seem to have these, these communities that are not a members of, of Tida seem to have a lot of influence over the, the ones that are, that have not supported the sales tax or have not supported state level changes that would be good for Tida. You will hear them say, these other communities, we, we can't just make Lucas County a member because then these other communities don't have a choice. They're, they're forced to be in it and they don't want to be. So maybe it's, it, it'd be good if the people living there started asking them, like, why don't, why don't you want to be in Toyota? I always say there isn't a Sylvania Township or Monclova Township mud hens, and there isn't a Springfield Township Museum of Art. You know, we are, there, I used to hear there's nothing to do in Toledo and that drove me nuts because with my limits on where I could go, I've lived here like 26 years before the pandemic and, you know, I felt like I wasn't getting to go to all, there's a lot out there I wasn't getting to. And that obviously would be a lot worse if I was living in a community that wasn't part of Tata. Um, So, you know, I think at these, you have some small towns, you'd think they would, and the Toledo is kind of right next door, you'd think they would um, be good to have that easy access. Um, another thing you might want to do in, in years that have odd numbers, city council, city councils and township trustees have elections. So if you, you know, Google your political party names or your board of elections and you find out who's running for city council, for example, then you can ask them where they stand. Um, right now, as we said, this bill is in the uh, the budget bill is in the Ohio Senate. Um, I just kind of set this this slide up to show kind of how email works for the Ohio House and Senate. With senators, it's their last name at OhioSenate.gov. With representatives, it's it's rep and their district number at OhioHouse.gov. Uh, there's a there's a form you can use to contact on their website, but this is the way you um, this is what their email addresses are. Um, some of our advocates who have already met with their legislators, the legislators mentioned that they wanted to be tagged on social media in messages about, or they even suggested videos um, 
uh, in messages that were about messages, videos about you, know, you, you using public transportation. Um, and, and that's something that if you, if you follow Cato on Facebook that we want to look at doing more of in the future, kind of a social media campaign. Tardo will sometimes send out a call to action or they'll send out a promotion if you're, if you're following them. Um, I just, just, I just put these up here real quick. The, the members of, of our, our US senators and representatives, they're not voting on this bill that we're talking about tonight, but you will see in the, a lot of times you see in the news, a really high number of public transit funding was passed, but that often includes federal money. And some of it is just what we kind of call pass through. Uh, it's come, it's from the federal government. The state uses it, the state gets it and they distribute it, but they really don't have any control over how it's spent. And a lot of it's for rural areas, I think, and that's fine. But, and then there's some, and then there's some money that the state has some discretion, but I think like the transit agencies are supposed to use it for new vehicles or they have, they can get new vehicles if they match the funding. So just federal money doesn't have the same freedom to be used for whatever the transit agencies need. And to change that, it would probably take, to change those rules, it would probably take the, the um, federal or state uh, representatives acting. And they, and also they can be talking to people at the state and local level, they might have some influence. I think we have somebody from uh, Senator Brown's office on tonight. I was glad to see that. Um, so in just the fed, what the federal government allocates for, for transportation and how they allow it to be used will also have, I think, I think especially in the area of rail and Amtrak, um, that's gonna have an influence even though they're not the ones voting on this, this bill that we're, that we're talking about. So it's, um, so, um, and I liked what uh, both Pastor Chris and Sarah alluded to that having your friends and family give you rides doesn't always, um, doesn't always cut it. Uh, you, because that you, then you, somebody used the word beholden and yes, you can be kind of beholden either to their schedules or to their, where they're interested in going. Um, and there's a lot of people like me out there that either could be working more than they are, and we don't have to spend the money on creating jobs if we can make it possible for people to get to the jobs that are out there, or maybe aren't working at all, or they could be working, you know, maybe somebody in, um, in, a, in one of these townships that doesn't have Tata could be working out at the Amazon uh, facility or somewhere else where they would they would need Tarda to, to get to. Um, took up a little bit of time there. Is that pretty much it? The slides will be, Katie, do you think that's pretty much it? The slides will be in the, in the recording when we send it out? Yes, and we will also make sure that the slides get emailed to all attendees after the presentation yeah. as well. And businesses and also people seem to want to locate where there's transportation. Um, millennials, some millennials who can drive don't, don't want to. And it's something businesses look at. Another source that you can look at is the American Public Transit Association's website. I didn't put it on my slides, but I think, I think it's under their news tab and it's called Public Transportation Facts. Um, and that's where they cite a lot of the things I just cited about businesses look at where there's public transportation when they look at where to relocate, uh, the $10,000 a year savings for a household. All right, so I think that is good, Jessica. Um, and then Angie wanted to give some um, remarks about her personal experience. And after that, we will ask um, for questions. So thank you so much for sharing your story, Jessica, and sharing how we can advocate for transportation funding and for helping us out with this forum. We really appreciate it. All right. So. Angie, do you want to get back on and share your story, please? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, 
I don't know if my audio is on. <clears throat> Lisa had turned it off. So can you see me? Oh. Oh. Okay. There we go. Yes, we can see you now. Okay, Jessica, thank you very much. You, you've really helped tremendously with planning this forum and you did an excellent job with your you know, presentation. Jessica is a wonderful advocate for transportation. Um, and as she mentioned about Cater, <clears throat> you can find us on Facebook. Um, you can send me an email if you'd like to know more about it. Um, and she had put that on her slide as well. I, I was not really gonna do a presentation or speak tonight because you know, I didn't want to steal the stage from other people and we had other speakers and but I, I think we're wrapping up a little bit early. So <clears throat> I think it does give a little bit of an opportunity to tell my story. I feel my story is pretty unique um, to some others, you know, people I've met over the years and um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, working at the Ability Center. So 22 years ago, um, when I was 32 weeks pregnant for my fourth child, I developed pancreatitis. It's only happened to four women in the world. And I was placed into a medically induced coma. And um, I had my daughter and I was only given 30% chance to live. And when I woke up out of my coma, I, I was totally blind. Um, I'm still blind to this day. Um, I, I have learned over the years that having a disability is not a bad thing, but it's a different thing. And, and people will ask me, you know, what is one of the hardest things that you have had to do, you know, and, and it's driving. I miss driving a lot. And, you know, so here I am, you know, I, I've been driving for years. I, I was 30 years old. So now everybody can do the math and know how old I am. But um, getting in your car and just being able to drive and, and, and then I have to learn to ride public transportation. And, and honestly, you know, I, I like um, Ken had said and Pastor um, Chris had said and, and Sarah did too, you know, we get to meet the drivers, you know, we get to meet a lot of the passengers that, that ride. Um, I become Facebook friends with some of the riders. Um, it, it gives us the time to chit chat a little bit and, and you know, kind of wind up for going to work. And, you know, so my, my point is, you know, None of us, you know, were born and said, well, you know, I, I want to have a disability or nobody left their house one day and got into an automobile accident and said, you know, when they woke up, you know, I could have a disability by the end of the day and, you know, need public transportation. Nobody knows, you know, what our future holds. And you may not need public transportation today or a loved one you know, or a child or, or whoever, you might not need it today, but you don't know when you're going to need it. So let's not miss the mark. We have a chance right now to make a difference, you know, to make phone calls and to do all of those things. And you're going to be making a difference for, you know, people that you might not even know. So I really encourage you all to, you know, help us be a voice, um, you know, um, I hope my story has maybe moved some of you like, whoa, you know, it could happen to you. So, so let's do our best and, you know, get out there and be supportive and write our letters and, and call, you know, our, our senators and whoever we got to call, you know, let's make a little noise and, and let's do this. So um, I, I really have a huge passion for transportation and, you know, the, the Ability Center you know, has the model that we are trying to make our community the most disability friendly community in the country, you know, and this is just one more step that we're getting there. But again, like Ken and Pastor Chris said, it's not only about people with disabilities, people writing fixed line, you know, there's a lot of people that rely on that, that fixed line, not just for employment, but to go shopping, you know, go to, go to doctor's appointments or maybe to go get their hair done. You know, as women, we all know when you get your hair done, you feel good. So that's what we could be missing. So um, if you guys have questions, uh, put them in the Q&A. Uh, I believe a minute ago we had one um, Q&A. Is that oh, right? Angie, we have two questions, but before I get to the questions, um, Sue shared 
a phrase in the chat that he says is worth saving and I think it is worth saving as well. So I would like to share that with everybody. Okay. Um, the phrase is mobility is the essence of our freedom. To the extent that mobility is limited for any of us, we are all less free. Hmm. That kind of gave me chills. So yeah. It's so that, true. It's very true. It is. Mm -hmm. So getting to the questions, we had a question that asked, when advocating for legislation, are there any businesses or companies who are willing to comment on how public transportation is beneficial in order to recruit and retain employees? It would be good to have the support of the business community, especially when trying to appeal to our current legislature. So I know Stu um, suggested in the question tab um, that it would be interesting to do a survey of major employers in the Toledo and Northwest Ohio area to see um, how many of their employees uh, depend or choose to use public transit, which might be a really actually great opportunity for Cater um, to do kind of a survey like that. But I was just wondering if anybody else could speak to whether or not they have, um, or they know of employers in the area who um, have either have spoken to the importance of public transportation or know of anybody who might be willing to speak to the importance of public transportation on their employees. I don't readily have that answer, but I do recall a conversation um, with Kim. Um, maybe it was a presentation that she did and she does have some um, companies where the employees rely on um, transportation. So I think um, we could give that answer to Kim um, and, and see if she could not, you know, email the answer. I think she, she's, she's got the answer. I know she does. Yeah, you're definitely right, Angie. This is Kelsey. Kim definitely has that information. I know that she's, again, developed a number of partnerships that are maybe new and she's learning about those opportunities and organizations that do have people who rely on our service. Um, but I'm sure that she could provide that information. Uh, it's great. Like Katie said, I mean, a survey or, or something, that's something for Cater to, to look into. Sure. Yeah, and Kelsey, I know your slide showed um, major Toledo businesses that are allies to TARDA. Do you know if any of them are commenting or are sharing their stories with the legislature at all? You know, I'm not, I'm not really sure if anybody's reaching out. Um, I'm looking at the, you know, I think that that big one right now is the Toledo um, Area Chamber of Commerce. I think that they're a really good indicator because they speak on a, on behalf of a lot of employers. Again, I don't know if there are specific ones. Um, Amazon comes to mind because we've just recently developed that relationship to have service that now serves both of their facilities, obviously at Southwick, but then also the new place in Rossford. Um, but I don't know if they're loudly speaking about that, that opportunity. Um, so I don't know who has a big verbal uh, a presence in the community, but again, I think that Kim could probably provide some of that insight. Okay. Um, this is another question that, that Kim might be able to provide more insight on, but we did get a question as to whether or not we are getting a new TARDA schedule. Um, uh, there are some service changes that are coming up and, you know, forgive me because when I was at CODA, I know that's do remember that service changes happened in January, May and September, triannually. TARDIS is on a different frequency and I really feel that some of those changes might take effect yet this month in March. So okay. again, we're going to have to confirm that with Kim, but yes, okay. there are some changes to the schedule that are coming up. Okay. And then we do have another question. Um, the question is, when I worked in Medicaid Health Home, we used to defend our funding with the healthcare costs saved via reduction or ER visits and readmits. Are there any statistics about the long-term unemployment costs, et cetera, that result from not funding public transportation? So any statistics that say, you know, if transportation isn't funded, um, you know, and people are unable to get jobs. Um, you know, are there any statistics that would point to um, that public transportation would help save those unemployment costs? 
I don't have the statistics immediately available. Stu, do you have any of that information? I mean, I know oh, that we have question. information about how we develop, how it develops economic or contributes to economic development, but on the converse. Yeah, I, I, sure. I, I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but I know, I know where I can probably get access to it and then provide it to the group afterwards. Um, I mean, somebody had talked earlier about, about uh, the, the savings, and I think it might have been Jessica yeah. talking about the, uh, the savings from using uh, transit over driving a car. And anecdotally, when I, uh, when I worked for the Ohio Rail Development Commission, we were headquartered at the time in the Levesque Tower in downtown Columbus. So I carpooled in with my wife in the morning and took Coda home at night. Um, this went on for about 10 months, and we calculated that in those 10 months, we saved uh, well over $9,000 in terms of, of the costs associated with owning a car. So, so this, you know, I mean, so I, I think, I think Jessica quoted a figure of around somewhere between 10 and 15,000. So I think that's probably about right. Um, and I was only using transit one way. I was, you know, there were times where I used it both ways, but, um, but every, every night I went home, I went home on the number two or the number four. And, uh, and you remember those Kelsey. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, Pastor Hanley was absolutely right too. You meet the most interesting people writing. Um, I, I, I once went home at night with two gentlemen that were having a conversation with each other in front of me. And it was like watching two people talk to each other, talk at each other. They were talking about two completely different things and, and, and but connecting, making eye contact. And they, you know, I mean, it was just, it was entertaining as can be to, to watch, to watch the conversation go on. And it was, you know, it was, it made it, a, it made it a fun ride. So at any rate, uh, but I will try and get my hands on that information um, about, about the, uh, about the, the economic development uh, impact, uh, because it is significant. It is significant, you know, the, and, and it's interesting that you talked about the, about the uh, Amazon facilities in Toledo. That's a great example of why it's so important for, uh, to, to have a very rich and varied transportation environment. Because if you recall, when Amazon was looking for its headquarters its second headquarters on the East Coast. Uh, well, it's, I mean, it eventually, it eventually landed on the East Coast, but they were, the, one of the things that they demanded was a rich environment, including public transit, inner city passenger rail, the whole, you know, walkable neighborhoods, bike, bikeable, bikeable streets, all of that. They wanted that for their, for their employees so that they could connect uh, with their jobs, but also have a good quality of life. Uh, that was their that was their mantra throughout that search, and it was interesting to to listen to uh, some you know folks here in Columbus who shall remain nameless, you know who were convinced that they had they had a, a leg up on everybody else, and I just kind of said no, you know you, you, it's it's not going to happen, you know we're not it's not going to happen in Ohio because we don't fund transit the way it should be funded. Um, we don't have inner city passenger rail to the degree that we that we should have, although that'll be changing soon i think so uh but that's why amazon located in new york city and uh washington dc which are both connected by probably the best best most rich transportation environment between two major cities that you'll see in the world mm. um and we did get an answer that yes tarda changes are coming at the end of this month um, and they are working on schedules and updates to their website now Thanks, Katie. I was just going to add that. Thank you. <laughs> yep, of course. Um, but other than that, we do not have any questions. So, Angie, do you want to wrap it up? Sure. Um, just with letting everybody know, you know, thank you so much for coming. Um, we would love to see you join our Cater Facebook page. Um, It'd be great to, to get some new members. Uh, we meet once a month um, after pandemic. Uh, we meet at St. Vincent's Hospital and um, we have pizza and cookies um, and uh, it's, it's really a great meeting. So we would love to see you join and, and you know, join efforts and 
you know, we can, we can all work on this and do this together. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I hope you have a great rest of your evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.